our final speaker of the day. And you know, I think I've done this to you more than once, right? Made you the final speaker of the day. But this is a, a wonderful young doctor. Okay, so Dr. Taylor Manalili, she graduated from Stony Brook School of Dentistry, or College of Dental Medicine, which one is it? Medicine. College of Dental Medicine. And then she stayed there and did a residency in prosthodontics. And then she joined us here immediately after that. And she's been such a great part of our team. She teaches me stuff every day, even stuff I don't really want to learn. And it's, it's great. She's just, a, she's just a fountain of tremendous information about dentistry. She's got an incredible love of dentistry that you're going to see come through as she talks to you today. Thank you, Dr. Park, and thank you everyone for hanging out till the end. This is the third time they've done this to me, by the way, I just want to say. Uh, three times this year I get to close these out, and I think we've only had three symposiums this year, right? So uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out till the end of the day. I'm really excited to meet all of you guys at the end of the day at Mesa Manor, have a few cocktails together. Um, and so we've heard some really phenomenal lectures today. We have saw some really beautiful cases by numerous clinicians. Um, so I am a prosthodontist. I uh, have a little OCD when it comes to my dentistry. I have a wonderful relationship with my lab technicians. I love utilizing the lab. And so I work with Dr. Justin Chi. I love him as a resource. We learn a lot from each other. Um, and he has really been a big proponent of me using this chair side system and trying it out. And in my stubborn ways, it took me a little while to jump on board. Um, but I do utilize it for a lot of treatments, not everything. I still love using my lab, but I want to talk to you today about some of the ways that I utilize the system uh, for some of my, my treatments that I do. And so I titled this Trial My Smile. So some of you, I use this term sometimes when I lecture, but I use this. Uh, specifically for some of my bigger aesthetic cases when I need to make sure the patient's happy, right? So trying out whatever smile creation you come up with and utilizing our bio temps, right? So I love that feature of the mill. Um, and it's probably the number one product that I use in my mill when I do my cases. But uh, so today I'm going to show you some cases and how I do some of these beautiful aesthetic cases. So. I want to talk about three particular patients today. I'm going to walk you through some of these cases. They each have their own challenges. And so really, the, the basis of this lecture is aesthetic challenges and how I handle that utilizing my chairside mill. And so this first patient is uh, near and dear. This is actually my father. Um, never treat family and friends, right? We all learn this. It's the worst thing to do. And so my father. Has, uh, he was a wrestler in high school, and he got his front tooth knocked out wrestling, and the dentist at the time made him this beautiful three-unit bridge that he had for 40-some-odd years. It was great. Uh, not being a dentist, I had no idea what was going on, right? And then I entered dental school, and I pointed it out to him, which was stupid. And he immediately went to his dentist and replaced it, or told them he no longer wanted the bridge, and he wanted an implant. And I said, Dad, can you just wait till I'm finished? You know, it's just like a few more years, just wait. And he didn't. He did it in my third year of dental school. And the dentist cut off this beautiful three-unit bridge that was hardly noticeable, placed an implant in the wrong position, and restored not only the three teeth, but restored all six anterior teeth. And this is what it looked like. So uh, not my favorite look in the world. And he was really unhappy with it. And he was really ashamed, and he stopped smiling for about a decade. And he kept asking me to redo it, but I learned pretty quickly I don't like treating family and friends. And uh, so <laughs> Justin actually convinced me to do it one day. We were sitting down. Uh, my parents visited last Christmas, and we were sitting down at dinner. And after dinner, Justin took me aside, and he's like, I will help you. Let's just do this. Like, I can't look at his smile anymore. <laughs> and so <laughs> with his help and guidance, uh, we started to tackle this. And so on Christmas Eve, we started this adventure. And uh, it really was a true adventure treating my father. So I want to explain some of this. And so when we look at him, the first thing I like to do with all of my patients, not just my father, is start with the face, right? We look at our full facial analysis. 
And so uh, we had our aesthetic symposium last week, and we talked a lot about this during the symposium. Some really great points for even just single units. We saw a bunch of doctors today talk about restoring just a single anterior. I love that with the mill. That is like one of the number one things I love to do. Those anterior teeth, instead of sending it back and forth to the lab, so nice restoring those in the office, right? And so doing this facial analysis, whenever we're doing single units all the way to full arches, I always like to look. So we look at facial thirds, right? I always want to make sure the patient's aesthetic vertical, so not necessarily dental vertical, but aesthetic vertical is pleasing. So especially when we're going to attempt any large restorative case, I want to make sure that I'm restoring them, not just conservatively, but to where they're going to look good from a facial perspective, right? And so I want to make sure that I'm not going to put them in a, what looks like a class two. I don't want to make sure I'm not going to put the, like, over open them, under, uh, under open them, things like that. So assessing the facial third. So thankfully, one of the good things was, is my father is fairly symmetrical when it comes to his face. So that was good. I didn't need to change his vertical. He was unhappy with his midline, or so he says. I think what he was unhappy was, was the, sym the symmetry of eight and nine, right? And so most of us, when we look at a midline, this is fairly well known, midline can be off to what, four millimeters, and most people have no clue or really don't notice it. We notice it because that's what we do, right? But most of our, most of our patients and friends do not notice when the midline is off. His midline was a little off but we are constricted to the space that we're in, right? And so we wanna, we wanna look at that. The other thing we wanna look at is our occlusal plane. And this is very important whenever we're doing these cases. And so this stands out to me the most when I look at his smile is his occlusal plane. So I assess this in a couple ways. We assess this looking from the front, right? And so when we assess the occlusal plane looking from the front, this goes back to dental school principles, denture principles, right? We set up a denture or set up a wax rim. Remember how we used to do that, put the fox plane in the mouth and look from the front, look from the sides? It's the same principles, whether we're doing complete removable, implant aesthetics, or toothborne aesthetics. I use this assessment the same way. So we look from the front, we look at the interpupillary distance, and I want to make sure eight and nine are on that plane, right? That, that is what is aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So if we don't do that, if we don't start that occlusal plane even to the eye, this is just a three degree cant. That is fairly noticeable, right? I'm gonna remove those lines. That's pretty noticeable to all of us. That's only three degrees, that's not a lot, okay? And so, thank you, Bobby. And so that, Bobby did some Photoshopping for me so we could see what that would look like if it was off, right? And so that is very, very noticeable to all that. So it's really important to get that occlusal plane right. So when we assess the occlusal plane, you can assess it from a profile view as well. And so from a profile view, if you remember the Fox plane, we look at the alar tragus line. This is taking us back, right? Alar tragus line should follow from the alar of the nose to the tragus of the ear. And so that plane of occlusion should rise up the same way. So in an ideal situation, his occlusal plane should rise back. From the centrals to the molars, it should rise back. What do we see when we look at him? We see this. So it's more of an obtuse angle instead of nice parallel. So when we look at him from the front, we see that reverse smile. So that is something we want to correct when we fix this. All right. So we have our incisal plane should be even with the eyes, and then we want it to rise back following that, that nice alar tragus line. All right, the other thing we want to look at is the incisal inclination. And so, remember, he didn't like his centrals. There's a reason. They were very forward in his arch. He has a very, this is a very tough case. He had a very triangular arch. Of course, nothing's ever easy with family. And so, eight and nine were in different planes. They're too far forward. So when we look at this, Eight, the incisal edge of our anterior teeth should be in line with our wet dry line of our lip. They're forward of the wet dry line, so they're too far out, they're too bucked. It's no wonder he didn't like it. Right? When we look at this from a profile view, it's very easy. So I encourage you, when you are designing in your office, so a couple doctors said they have like parties while they're designing in their labs, right? 
So we leave the patient, we let them relax, we send them home, whatever we do. Um, we don't want to be running in and out of the patient to look at them. So I like to take photos. Take photos of your patient. Take a profile photo. Take a frontal smile photo. Have them available when you're doing these designs. It makes it much easier to visualize where you want to go. So we can very easily see that these teeth are too far forward. So we need to bring them, somehow bring them back. And so we know all of this before taking off the crowns or touching the patient. I now have a really good idea of where we want everything to be. Okay. So we want to assess what was done. <laughs> and so what is the main, the main thing that sticks out to me when I look at this are his canines, right? And so when we look at the length of all of these, to me, the canines are very long. It is October, so I know some patients like vampire teeth, but I don't want to look at that on my dad year round. And so this is something to me that I either want to shorten them or lengthen the teeth around them to let them blend in a little bit better. So we do like to start with these centrals. I keep talking about the centrals, but this is really important. It's where everything starts to form. And so we like to look at golden proportions are wonderful in an ideal world, but remember I mentioned there was an implant placed in him? And so when we pull back his lips, this is what this looks like. I can't necessarily do golden proportions on this because we will wind up potentially with uh, or something looking really out of whack, right? And so what I like to start with is just the display of the centrals. And so when I assess this, it's really important to assess the patient at rest. And so, <laughs> and so women and men tend to show different amounts of their central incisors when they're at rest, different amounts of their anterior teeth. So females tend to show a little bit more than males. So in females, something very aesthetically pleasing is about two to four millimeters. When the patient is at rest, you want their mandible to just be relaxed. So have them sit up in a nice neutral position. You might need to do a little deprogramming, get their mu facial muscles nice and relaxed. Lips can be a little parted. And so you want to look at the length of their teeth. You don't want to, so one of my friends says this the other week, is you don't I'm talking about dentures, you don't want a patient to come in and you look at them and you don't know if they're wearing their denture or not, right? You want to see the teeth, okay? I love that. With males, they tend to show a little bit less. Um, I kind of gauge it on the patient's age, how I think the more we show, the kind of more youthful the appearance is. So sometimes we show, we want to show a little bit more. But male tend to sh males tend to show about 0.5 to 2 millimeters of teeth at rest. And so we know what our goals are. And so now I want to bring this back to the smile window. So I know I might not get those golden proportions I want, but is it actually necessary in this patient? And so when we look at the smile photo, some of the things you can have patients do, so I always want to assess their high smile. Sometimes I'll have them close their eyes and smile nice and big. A lot of patients become like a little uninhibited. So he didn't smile for like a decade because he hated his teeth. And every time I would try to make him laugh, he would do like the cover up, right? Um, and so you have them close their eyes. I'll have Will, my, my office manager, like dance around, sing a song, make people laugh, right? And so he's really good at getting cracking jokes, getting our patients to laugh and show their true smile. And so we want to see what that true smile is, what that true smile window is before we plan our case. And so looking at that window, I don't really have a lot of concerns, right? So when we, when we pull the lips back, we really don't show any of those issues, which is, again, a really good thing, right? I don't have to involve any of their specialties. I don't have to worry about changing the tissue contours, um, worrying about that implant, I don't think, at this point, right? I haven't taken anything off yet, but it's not directly on my radar. All right, and so then we take our intraoral scan. Right, so this is the modern day dental exam. We take, our, we take our scan and we start our assessment again. And what do we see? We see the reason he doesn't like these, right? The reason we all don't like these is they're on a totally weird plane. When this, when this doctor designed these and created these, they go, the light touches them. They touch them at a completely different angle. No wonder everyone doesn't like them and he doesn't want to smile. And so we know we need to straighten those out a little bit. But when we take the crowns off, we can see why this dentist probably had a lot of trouble doing this, right? The 
eight is way forward of nine. Nine is the implant. Um, tissue actually looks pretty decent around that implant, but it's still placed in the wrong position. Guided surgery, everyone, right? So <laughs> everything's in the wrong position. It's too late. I don't want to take it out on him, so we're going to deal with what, what we have. But this, this chair side system, this ability to have, to be able to manipulate and play, we were able to try this out and see how we could do, right? Just sending this to the lab. If I just sent this model to the lab, right, the lab would send back a wax up and it might look great on the model, but when we translate that into the patient's mouth, everything's turned now. So it's probably gonna look similar to what he had to begin with, right? And so now, we have the patient in the chair. It's perfect. So we can mill out our bio temps, mill out our design, and try it in the mouth. So we make our bio temps. We mill out just 6 through 11. It might not be everything. It's not everything we did. But we started there. And we put it in the patient's mouth. We did this on Christmas Eve. And my parents left, what, a day later, two days later? So we crossed our fingers. I had my dad schedule his flight back like two weeks later. I'm from New York, by the way, so they were like 3,000 miles away. Hoped and prayed that nothing fell out for those two weeks. But he got to play around. He got to wear them and try them out. And we tested phonetics. He tested function with them. Everything worked great. Couple little tweaks we wanted to make. But overall, we were pretty happy. I love this. So it's a Dr. Zant this morning that was talking about fetishes with margins, right? <laughs> Uh, I love this trial your smile because one of the things that I always get really nervous about is margins not fitting, especially on these bigger cases. If you miss one margin of something, it's a disaster on these aesthetic cases. And so I love being able to sit and check every margin of my biotemp before I mill out my finals, I send it to the lab to mill out my finals, right? And so, hint, hint, I don't like to do lab work like Dr. Chi does. I went to dental school, not, not CDT school. So I, uh, I did learn a lot of laboratory procedures in my residency, but I like knowing how they're done. Personally, I do not like spending my time doing that. So I use chair side where I'm happy, and then I do utilize the lab for these bigger cases. So once the bio temps are good to go, I'm happy with my margins, I'm happy with the way they look, I'm happy with the way he looks. We have maybe little minor changes we want to make. It's a long day. You can see his eyes are bloodshot. <laughs> then I'm going to send this case to Gladwell, right? So then I send it off to the lab, and they can do all the hard work, right? I'm not worried. It's not a single unit. I'm not worried about shade. Everything is going to look the same, right? I know the lab is great at doing this. And so then I'm going to send this to the lab, and he comes back, and it makes a world of a difference, right? So now we know. He's super thrilled, and this is, I had him take a selfie of himself, so <laughs> because he went back home, and we, we haven't had him back here. But uh, yeah, so he took a nice selfie, and he's very happy, and now he smiles nice and big. And so doing some of these bigger cases, utilizing the mill, really gives you that ability to play around. And so we did a couple variations of those biotemps until we dialed in that aesthetics the way we liked it. OK, patient number two. So this seems uh, missing an anterior tooth. So for a lot of these patients, implants are considerations. Maryland bridges are considerations. So this patient, uh, she came to me uh, actually with, I wish I had a picture of this, but she came with, uh, with braces on her teeth. And she had a really bad relationship with her orthodontist. She was in ortho for a really long time. Uh, I think it was like five years she was in and out of ortho. Um, Brackets were breaking. She was not really compliant. She was not happy with him. She wanted nothing to do with going back into ortho, like, at all. And so I was a little bit stuck, because when we look at her profile, her teeth are not really in the best position. But she wanted nothing to do with it. And so here we are. Her can'ts off. There's a lot of, a lot of things I don't love about this, not super ideal. Um, and she's young, but we explained everything, and then this is where we wanted to go. And so we had to figure out how to get everything into the right plane for her and nice and restored. And so a couple things I don't love, but we have to comply with the patient. And so we start again with the incisal 
edge of her centrals. All right, so right away we see that we have a little bit of work to do. And so with these cases, I like to do mock-ups. Right? Mock-ups are very helpful. And so we have all sorts of technology to help us. So I use, they have like Smileify out there, DSD app. I'm checking the rest position to see what shows, like we talked about. And so then I do this just digital mock-up so I myself can see what this could look like. And then I take that mock-up, make sure it aligns with the uh, horizontal plane of her interpupillary line, and then I bring that into her mouth and do a little mock-up. Check the rest position, make sure I'm happy, and then I scan that in. And that is what I use to start my design, right? I have a nice starting plane for my restoration. However, you know, I, you have to learn to trust yourself a little bit, but we always, when we get into the mouth away from the patient, for some reason we always just have a little change of mind, right? So we start designing this. I make my design. It looks, it looks great, right? We, everything's really far out, so we want to push everything back in. We mill our biotemp bridge blocks out, and then we put this in the patient's face. All right, when we put this in her face, looks okay, looks all right. If the lab did this, I would be like up in arms. I'd be very upset. But I did it, so I really don't have anyone else to blame but myself, right? <laughs> so it's okay. I'm happy with it-ish. It's a learning, learning curve. And so what do we see? It follows the arch really nicely, which is what the lab would totally do. And I fell into the same shoes that they did. Right? I didn't trust my instincts and my guts with what I, what I planned out for myself. I, I changed that incisal inclination a little bit. Right? And so when we, when we break this down and look at this, the midline's fairly good, so I'm pretty happy with that. But then when we go ahead and look at this incisal edge position, we see that it definitely does not follow her interpupillary lines anymore. Right? It, it cants up. But so does her whole arch. Right? So when we look at this from from a profile view, like what happened here? When we look at this from a profile view, we'd follow her alar tragus lines and follow her occlusal planes, if this ever works. We see that she has two different occlusal planes, right? So because of ortho, one side is up, the other side is down. It was never properly fixed. And so I follow that arch, arch form when I designed it myself, and here we are. This is what we ended up with. But it's chair side, so it's very easy for me. I now know what I did, and I can go back in and quickly fix that. And so we see it right away. She hangs out for another 20 minutes, and we mill out a new one, right? So we see, again, this is only three degrees off. Remember I said three degrees is the noticeable? So three de it's 3.5 degrees. Very, very noticeable to us. So we mill out the new one, and much better. Right? So now we know interpupillary line, it's perfect. I'm happy, everyone's happy. And we send that to the lab now, because I don't like to deal with staining. That is not my forte. I could probably learn, I just don't want to. I have, should sit in with Justin's class one time. And so then I send that off to Glidewell to be finished. And now the patient comes back and is super happy. And that looks beautiful. That is a very challenging case to do with the lab. That would go back and forth probably several times because that cant of the arch is very hard for a laboratory technician to see. Right? So this makes it much, much easier for us to do some of these really challenging cases utilizing the lab. Right? So our, our mill is wonderful. I don't have the patience to sit and wait for a Bruxer art uh, bridge block to mill out. I just don't. Um, but I do love what the lab can do once I give them that beautiful template. Okay. So my last patient I wanted to talk about is, uh, so this is a good friend of ours, and she, she unfortunately, if anyone can notice, I'm gonna zoom in on her smile a little bit. So she was restored with some beautiful restorations a while ago, but you can see she is congenitally missing a tooth, right? So we see we are congenitally missing her lateral. And they created, they changed her canine to a lateral, uh, but didn't really bother doing much with her premolars. And so it doesn't really look the best. It's pretty, but it's, uh, I think we can definitely improve on her smile a little bit. 
And so things that stand out, we have a lot of gingival display. And so we want to, so this is actually, uh, Dr. Chi did this case. I stole this from him. And so what he did was he used the water lays and he went in and he did a little gingivectomies on this patient, some crown lengthening in certain areas. And then uh, we created the biotemps and the biotemps were able to allow the tissue to heal. And so this is really, really nice feature. So the biotemps went in, polished those up nicely and they let the tissue heal for a while. And again, so all of these cases, especially cases where we're really manipulating tissue far below the tissue, I like to go through and check all the margins. So we check the margins, make sure everything's okay. Um, I didn't mention this before, but I also love this. I think someone mentioned it in their presentation earlier, but you can check the thickness. So Mike Silveris this morning, the Chief Technology Officer of Glidewell mentioned that one of the things we love to do as dentists is under-reduce, right? And so in the software, as you all know, you can go in and it gives you warnings if you're under-reduced. But when we change materials, you might, not under, you might not catch it. And so I do like to always go in and measure the thickness of how much I'm reduced. You can measure the biotemp itself or you can use the software to do it. But always check that out before you proceed on. So we check our thickness, we check our margins, and we let her heal for a while. And we let her, so she's very, uh, she's very particular about how she wanted these made, which is great, I love that. But it gives us the opportunity to kind of go back and forth with our design and change what we want to. So how many iterations of this did we go through? A couple, right, a few. Uh, a few, <laughs> but we wanted to make the patient happy. And so it's so nice to be able to go through and tweak exactly what she's telling us to tweak. It's so hard to do that, communicating with the lab, right? Communication is like one of the toughest things I think we have to do as dentists, um, back and forth. It's really, really tough. And so having this ability to change those aesthetics right there in your office is huge. And so once we dial it all in, then we go ahead and we send it forward. We get our final restorations and Broxer aesthetic. And you can just see, so one of the things I want to point out is just this tissue. And so this was nice and healed. I wish I had a picture with the biotemps like after it fully healed. But the biotemps are such a nice material on the soft tissue, right? They're milled, so they're really not as porous as if we made any chair side provisionals. You're really able to, te to test that final so test the function. So I recently did a case where I designed a crown for number three, maxillary molar. I put a provisional in, everything was great and fine, and then we wound up taking out the molar behind it, just cracked the tooth, took it out, and thankfully, thankfully it was still in a biotemp because then she started biting her cheek, right? We lost a tooth. And so I was able to go back in, redesign the biotemp, popped out the cusp, and she doesn't bite her cheek anymore. And so I really do love testing restorations, even if it's a single unit, with the biotemp to make sure the patient is comfortable, and then milling it out in our final. It's not for every situation, but it really, really is nice. It is a beautiful material for tissue. All right, and then we get our final result. And so this. This is kind of how I go back and forth using the mill and the lab, all right? And it really does, the goal is really to make our patients happy, right? Um, we have heard some really wonderful things from all of our speakers today of using multiple mills. Uh, we have, how many mills? Ten, I think we have a few mills that we use here, a couple, um, but, <laughs> Being able to mill these out in biotemps is really nice. And so even when you do these bigger cases, don't be afraid to do them in your office because they mill out in each one of these units mills out in less than 10, five to 10 minutes. And you can do a full arch of these and really test your aesthetics chair side. Um, really dial these in, get them where you wanna be before you send them to the lab. So you don't have to do, like once you commit to this chair side, you do not have to do finish the case yourself. The lab is here for you. 
And so I do this quite a lot with these bigger cases. It's very easy for me to dial in and do this um, on this level. And so remember, biotemps are a wonderful material. Um, I, the, the stats this morning, I know we're all really uh, gung-ho about using those, those single unit Bruxer blocks, but for a lot of these cases, I'm using biotemps first. And so you can check your margins, check the fit, make sure the contours are good, you can check your thickness of your restoration. So all these little details that the lab has such a hard time when we underprepare, don't give them good information, right? We're all becoming better dentists because of what we do. I have become such a better dentist since I've started embracing digital technology. Um, you can ask Justin, when I started here, I didn't like the chair side unit. I was still doing conventional PVS impressions. I, I, I used a scanner in the past, but like a lot for exams and diagnosis and you know the Invisalign case here or there. But I really didn't like to take impressions with it. And when I started at Glidewell, he kept pushing me. He watched me do a few. And then you know the, the, when I had to repeat a full arch impression, he was like, you sure you don't want to just try it once? It'll save you a lot of time. And so I finally gave in and did it. And it really has made just a world of a difference in so many perspectives. Um, it's just so much easier to scan these patients. And you have this copy for forever to go back. If they break a restoration, it's on file for yourself. So you can verify all of your aesthetics, your function, everything. It really is just a wonderful, a wonderful tool to have. And so I like flew through that, maybe because it's the end of the day, and I really want to do this with you all. I don't know. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, it's okay, because we have, I think we have a ton of questions for our speakers, and so you'll have a little bit of time to ask some questions. Um, I am not on the panel, so if anyone has a question, we can do that for a moment. Um, but otherwise, I have no pressure. I will be at the house later. Yes? So preferred temporary cement. Uh, so we typically, uh, we use Tempon, I like to use Tempon Clear. A lot. I like that it's tack cured. That's nice and fast. Uh, we use Bifix also at times. If someone is if someone is wearing it a little bit longer, then we'll put them in Bifix. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna hand this to you. Thank you, sir.